Nick. This webinar is being recorded and live streamed on YouTube. This will be available on FIP website for one year. If you want to go back and take another look at it. Uh, <clears throat> you can ask questions during the presentation. To ask questions, you go to the bottom of your screen, you will see several tabs. One of them says Q&A. Use that to type in your questions. If you wish to chat with other attendees, you can use the chat box. We invite you to become members of uh, FIP. And there is a link there that you can click on if you wish to uh, join us as members of FIP. We also welcome your feedback and there is a link for that as well. Let's go to the next slide. Today's panelist is Professor Olivia Merkel. She's Professor of Drug Delivery at Ludwig Maximilian University in Munich in Germany. Uh, by the way, Ludwig Maximilian has got deep expertise in RNA technology. There are uh, there's a, quite a bit of research going on at that university. Uh, <clears throat> it is today's next slide. Next slide. Yes. Um, today's topic is RNA based medicines for unmet needs. I'm going to turn this over to Olivia to pick it up from this point on. Olivia, it's all yours. All right, thank you very much. I hope you can hear me well. And uh, thank you so much for the introduction, as well as the invitation to speak here today. It's my, my honor and my pleasure as a pharmacist by training um, to give this presentation to probably a lot of pharmacists around the globe, as I've seen in the, in the chat already. I wanted to give you a little bit of an introduction about the work that we do in my lab. And um, we have a, um, uh, we have people with interdisciplinary backgrounds in my group. We usually start um, our projects on, on RNA formulation and delivery with material science, where we synthesize mainly polymers. And we also work with lipid nanoparticles for RNA formulation and delivery, but the main focus is really polymeric um, uh, non-viral vectors. With these materials that we make in-house, we usually go on um, for formulation science studies where we encapsulate RNA into nanoparticles using uh, microfluidics, for example. And um, one uh, important piece of the research I will present today is spray drying, where um, we combine, um, let's say, the more nanotechnology with really classical pharmaceutical technology, which is my background, to obtain dry powder formulations and that obviously help with um, storage stability of nano suspensions, but are also suitable for um, inhalation. And with the formulations that we um, establish and, and develop, we initially test in in vitro and sophisticated ex vivo models that I will present today for the, the um, bigger goal of administering in vivo, where we have a focus on pulmonary delivery, which is really what I will be talking about today. The, most of the work that we do is, is RNA delivery and with a focus on short interfering RNA, but um, we also work on, um, on messenger RNA uh, delivery, on um, uh, self-amplifying RNA, circular RNAs, and so on. And um, as you probably know, um, RNA molecules with flake acids in general are large molecules um, that don't easily diffuse through the cell membrane like a, a small molecule um, could potentially do but that's why we usually need a delivery system. And um, as probably everyone has learned um, during the years of the pandemic, there are viral vectors and, and non-viral vectors. Um, we can use uh, a viral uh, delivery systems to deliver uh, an mRNA or to deliver a, um, a, a genetic um, vaccine, or we can use a non-viral delivery system that we load um, with messenger RNA or um, other RNAs that, that we make ourselves. And um, so in this delivery system, we usually encapsulate um, a, a small interfering RNA or some of the other RNAs I mentioned. We um, use mainly um, polymer nanomaterials and um, we often attach um, targeting ligands, which is mentioned here as a recognition molecule. The reason why we often attach these recognition molecules or targeting ligands is that 
we can, with this, essentially mimic what viruses do. And um, as you know, viruses are very effective in uh, delivering genetic material to our cells. So um, what happens when a virus or also a non-viral um, nanocarrier interacts with uh, the recognition uh, molecules and the, the cell receptors is that um, it triggers um, receptor-mediated endocytosis, which you see here. And so with the budding of the um, cell membrane, we usually obtain uh, um, an endosome where um, then initially this nanomaterial is encapsulated. And um, one of the most important steps in um, nucleic acid delivery to the cell, particularly with these non-viral systems, is the so-called endosomal escape um, where the nanomaterial and particularly the RNA or the DNA needs to be released from the endosome before the endosome merges with the lysosome because in the lysosome, um, nucleic acids uh, would most probably be degraded. So as soon as the um, RNA uh, reaches the, the cytoplasm, um, in case of the smart, small interfering RNA, it can then be incorporated into the so-called RNA-induced silencing complex, which has an endonuclease activity and um, this endonuclease activity um, then uh, allows for a cutting of the um, complementary messenger RNA. So the activated um, RNA-induced silencing complex will only contain the um, antisense strand of the siRNA that um, then binds um, in a base complementary way to uh, its target messenger RNA. And upon activation of the endonuclease activity, this messenger RNA is degraded and um, with the degraded messenger RNA, the um, target protein can no longer be expressed. And so that's what we usually call a gene knockdown or gene silencing. Now, probably many of you know that um, there are a few siRNA-based drugs that uh, were approved. And the first one in August uh, uh, 2018 by the FDA and shortly after by, by EMA in Europe. And the first one um, was a nanoparticle, a lipid nanoparticle loaded with short interfering RNA, which is called um, onpatro um, or patisseron. And um, so this nanoformulation essentially also was a bit of a template um, for what was then used during the pandemic for the messenger RNA vaccines. So these are lipid nanoparticles um, with pegylated um, lipids, uh, with helper lipids, uh, with cholesterol and um, ionizable lipids that um, are very efficiently taken up um, by the uh, by um, hepatocytes in the in the liver when they're administered intravenously. And shortly after, um, three additional siRNA drugs were approved. And so in, in all of the um, uh, later approved uh, siRNA drugs, the siRNA double strand was then attached um, to a trivalent GALNAC. And so also trivalent GALNAC um, very efficiently targets the liver. So what we currently have on the market are essentially four siRNA drugs, but all of them only target the liver. And um, what we are mostly interested in is trying to um, establish siRNA delivery and RNAi drugs for delivery beyond the liver. And so the target organ that we focus on is the lung, because as you probably know, um, as pharmacists, uh, we're very familiar with pulmonary delivery and with inhalation um, therapy, where we can directly reach the lung by inhalation and where we can circumvent um, the first pass effect um, with a non-invasive administration route. The, the other um, advantage is that we can reduce systemic side effects, particularly if we want to really deliver to the lung. As you also probably know, the lung can also be used for as a port of entry for delivery through the lung and into systemic um, circulation as an in inhaled insulin, for example, but our main focus is usually delivery to the lung and not delivery through the lung for a, a local um, uh, uh, therapeutic effect for the treatment of, of lung diseases. And so with inhalation, so with delivering our nanoparticles um, with an aerosol into the lung, we can increase the lung retention. So we, have, we can have longer um, high drug uh, um, concentrations in the lung as compared to any other administration route. And we can exploit the physiology of the lung where we have a large surface area that's about um, 100 square meters or almost uh, 1,000 square feet, 
uh, about a, a two-bedroom apartment, uh, not in Munich, um, but maybe somewhere else in the world, uh, where you have a really big area, of, a really big surface area um, where you can deposit the drug and uh, where you can exploit um, the, uh, the physiology and anatomy of the lung. There's also the advantage of a high vascularity, which is particularly um, interesting if you want to deliver through the lung. So if you want to um, reach these um, uh, vessels in the lung. And for nucleic acid um, delivery, it's very important that the lung has no serum proteins because serum proteins usually contain RNAs or other nucleases, and they would um, degrade the, the RNA. And since they're not present in the lung, we have a very low RNA um, concentration within the lung. We also have a thin epithelium, which again is more an advantage for delivery through the lung if you want to deliver um, beyond the so-called blood-air barrier. But then we also have a few barriers in the lung, of course. So you can see the, the lung epithelium here. And um, this is a, a schematic of a, a virus infection, of a, a coronavirus infection, for example. And um, so the way that uh, coronaviruses and, and other viruses are taken up by the epithelium is that they um, very efficiently make it through the mucus, which is usually um, covering the um, uh, any mucosa and, um, and the lungs, of course. So the presence of mucus in the upper airways and, and then and the presence of surfactant in the, the lower airways can be a, um, a disadvantage or a barrier because of course, we need to um, overcome these uh, layers of, of mucus, and mucus, of course, um, uh, slows down diffusion uh, through its um, viscosity. And then surfactant, for example, is a, a major hurdle for delivery of lipid nanoparticles, because as you know, surfactant is made out of phospholipids, and so are um, uh, lipid nanoparticles. And so um, surfactant tends to destabilize um, lipid nanoparticles in the lungs, for example. The other point are um, size requirements. So um, as I mentioned already before, um, depending on where in the lung we want to deposit, um, we also need to reach um, specific size requirements um, for the position in the deep lungs. We need a large, a smaller um, uh, droplets or, or smaller powder particles, whereas um, for delivery into the bronchial area, for example, even a, a larger um, particle uh, or or um, droplet size would still be sufficient. And that's something that I will mention again uh, later on when we talk about the actual inhalation. As you may know, um, uh, El Nylum's first clinical trial was actually um, uh, a clinical trial against RSV, respiratory syncytical virus. So El Nylum's first approach to get a drug approved was actually um, uh, the idea of delivering to the lung. However, um, in their clinical trial, El Nylum um, chose intranasal administration and um, they made it into a phase two of the clinical trial and unfortunately didn't meet um, the clinical endpoints. And uh, a few years later, um, now we understand um, maybe to some extent why um, they, they didn't succeed with their clinical trial. And so one of the reasons um, might be that they used a, a single siRNA sequence. And so what we've seen with um, SARS-2 over the past um, two and a half years is that viruses, of course, mutate very quickly. And so if they are under evolutionary um, pressure and they're treated with just one single siRNA sequence, um, it's uh, very um, much expected that they will um, come up with escape mutations. And um, it's possible that, unfortunately, their clinical trials may not have worked out because um, they didn't use a pool of different siRNA sequences. On the other hand, um, they also they used an administration route that might not have been um, uh, conducive for treating a, a disease in the lung, because if you compare um, the, the biodistribution of RNA after inhalation, two hours after the, um, the administration, you can see the lung lobes here. You see the kidneys, for example, this is a, a mouse that was treated. So after two hours, um, quite some of the um, RNA made it into the kidneys already, which is also not surprising, knowing that um, short interfering RNA is usually um, cleared through the kidneys, it's uh, cleared renally um, into the, the bladder. Um, but after inhalation, you really see a good amount in the lung lobes, um, in the trachea as well. You can see a little bit in the oropharynx. 
but the, the major part of the dose is really in the lung lobes. And that's where, um, for a, a respiratory virus, we want to deliver the RNA. In comparison, if you look into intranasal delivery, two hours after administration, we still see a lot um, in, in the oropharynx, but um, even in an area that um, is, the, uh, is the, the cranial area. So what, we, um, what you cannot appreciate from, from this low resolution image, but what we investigated later on, is that um, quite some nose to brain delivery actually happens if we deliver uh, to the nose. And I mean, at least if we instill um, into the nostrils of a, um, uh, of, of a mouse, for example. And um, if you look at, uh, at the lung lobes, um, you actually see that only a very small amount of the administered dose makes it into the lung. And so that could also have been one of the explanations um, to why the Alnalin clinical trial did not work out. The animals swallow a lot. You can see um, the stomach and the intestines already. You could also see the bladder. So um, no matter what administration route we choose, um, RNA usually is excreted through the kidneys and, and into the bladder. But uh, what was striking really was the difference um, between how little dose we deliver to the lung by intranasal administration versus um, inhalation. Now, of course, inhalation um, uh, is, is something uh, where patient compliance plays an important role. And uh, if you tell a patient that they have to inhale um, with a, a, a pari, for example, for half an hour, it's not exactly what they, what they like to hear. Um, also, um, if you um, develop a, um, if you developed a, a pressurized meter dose inhaler, um, it's it's quite tricky to to develop something for a nano suspension where you can have nanoparticles and then patients still um, often don't really know exactly how to use such a pressurized meter dose inhaler. Um, also, the the coordination uh, between administration and uh, and holding your breath and inhaling and so on um, can be quite tricky. So um, this is why we opted for um, dry powder formulation, and um, that's what I will talk about in in a little bit. But before that, um, I wanted to give you a, a bit of an idea of um, some of the materials that I will mention later on in, in the, the presentation. Um, we currently are working on new biodegradable materials that I hope will be published very soon. And I, I hope to give an update um, uh, soon about uh, some of the, the um, uh, more exciting and, and most of all more biocompatible and biodegradable materials. But for a lot of the proof of concept work that we've done in the past years, um, we use polyethylenamine, PEI. And uh, PEI is a very broadly used um, non-biodegradable material. We usually use low molecular weight PEI um, to reduce um, uh, side effects and, and toxicity. And uh, we actually saw that in uh, healthy animals, PEI is tolerated um, quite well. Um, but we don't use PEI as it is, but we usually modify um, PEI polymers, for example, with such targeting ligands, um, such as transferrin, which you see here. Or um, what we've also learned in the past years is that for siRNA delivery, it's very important to have a certain um, a balance between the, the hydrophilic and um, cationic PEI and a hydrophobic polymer. And then um, often having PEG as a shielding mechanism um, can be quite important um, to stabilize colloidal stability and, uh, and also to, um, uh, to prevent uh, protein corona formation, for example. So what you see in the upper part is a transferrin modified PEI, and I will talk about why we use transferrin in, in just about a minute. And then in the lower part, you see um, a polymer that we often abbreviate as PPP because it's a PEI coupled with polycaprolactone and uh, polyethylene glycol. And this amphiphilic material then forms micelles and um, self-assembles with siRNA, whereas the, um, the transferrin-modified PEI simply um, interacts uh, with siRNA based on charge-charge interaction. So the reason why um, we made transferrin PEI, and, and that idea obviously was not entirely new because uh, my colleague um, Ernst Wagner here in Munich has been working with transferrin PEI since the 1990s, but um, our idea was a little bit different um, from what had been published because what wasn't known um, in, in the, the previous years is that um, uh, activated T cells um, actually have a high expression of transferrin receptor. 
Transferrin um, targeting has been used a lot in, in cancer targeting, and that's what it was uh, used for and known for. And uh, T cells, on the other hand, um, have um, been considered almost like the holy grail for, for transfection. And if any of you have ever tried to transfect T cells, you probably had to um, move on to electroporation because T cells um, uh, don't express cavalin, for example, and cavalin usually mediates this um, cavalin mediated um, endocytosis. And so T cells per se don't usually endocytose um, nanomaterials, which is good um, because they are they're very protected cells because they need to protect us. But then viruses such as the HI virus, for example, very efficiently um, uh, uh, reaches T cells. And so we tried to look into how we could essentially mimic what the HI virus does. And HI virus does not use a transfer receptor, but it also uses receptor mediated uptake. And so the reason why we wanted to um, deliver siRNA to, to T cells is that um, we started um, uh, an asthma project um, in collaboration with a, a different group initially. Um, and they, they told us that um, uh, GATA3, which is a, a transcription factor in, in activated um, T helper 2 cells, is a very good target um, for a very good um, therapeutic target for severe asthma. And um, as pharmacists, we know that there are lots of asthma drugs on the market, but unfortunately, all of these asthma drugs essentially palliate sim uh, symptoms. So um, we can use, for example, mast cell stabilizers, um, or we can use antihistamines, and, and uh, we can also work on the smooth muscle um, with beta um, sympathomimetics. But we usually um, are at the very end um, of this pro-inflammatory cascade. And so what they found and, and, and uh, what they explained to us is that um, uh, this, this slide, which seems rather busy, is actually um, it's not so complicated if, if you look at it. So what usually happens, and I apologize that the, the antigen presenting cell here is missing, but what usually happens is that when an allergen is presented uh, to an, L, an antigen presenting cell, this antigen presenting cell will then activate a naive T cell to differentiate into a so-called Th2 cell. And upon um, activation and differentiation, this Th2 cell will upregulate its, its transcription factor GATA3. And um, GATA3 then drives the secretion of all of the Th2 cytokines, which are um, interleukin-4, interleukin-5, and interleukin-13. And so then this whole orchestra of inflammation will start um, where IL-13, for example, activates the, the epithelium and particularly the, the goblet cells to produce more mucus. It will also activate B cells um, to produce more antibodies um, against the allergen. And IL-4 does the same, but it also has um, a positive feedback loop onto Th2 cell proliferation. IL-5, on the other hand, activates eosinophils um, to produce second messengers to activate the, the epithelium. And uh, what happens with the B cells, um, if they produce antibodies that are then presented on mast cells, is that when the mast cell um, sees the allergen again, it will degranulate and, um, and secrete histamine and uh, cause um, smooth muscle um, obstruction and uh, the wheezing in, in asthma. So um, what had been published when we started this project is that you can, for example, um, silence um, interleukin-13 production by Th2 cells. And with that, um, you can see a decreased level, you can see decreased levels of interleukin-13. But unfortunately, with that, usually the levels of IL-5 and IL-4 will go up. And so we don't really see any um, therapeutic effects of downregulating um, IL-13 even if in, in principle, the, the downregulation is working. Um, so in the, what we decided in the next step was um, to not just palliate uh, another um, symptom and, and downregulate IL-13, but we decided um, that we wanted to downregulate um, GATA3 because the idea with this was that we would be able to downregulate all of the TH2 cytokines all at the same time if we downregulated um, GATA3. But the, the problem, or let's say the, the challenge in this project was that it's very difficult to um, deliver siRNA or nanoparticles in general into these T cells. 
And so this is when we um, found out that activated T cells have a high expression level of transferrin receptor. And so we used the uh, um, transferrin modified PEI to deliver siRNA to the lung of um, uh, a mice in an, an asthma model where we compared um, uh, animals with symptoms of asthma that we had sensitized against ovalbumin as a model um, uh, allergen in comparison to healthy animals um, that had just received sodium chloride. And um, so after 40 days of establishing this inflammation model and this asthma model, we um, then administered um, nanoparticles with fluorescently labeled um, siRNA into the lungs of these mice. And we saw that um, in the T cells, um, really having transferrin modified PI as the nanocarrier for the RNA brings a big, big, big benefit because if we compare to blank and untreated animals, and so these are just the T cells um, that we obtained from the lungs of these um, animals, there's of course a, a certain um, autofluorescence. And if we compare to free as the RNA, of course the RNA is not efficiently taken up as I mentioned to you already. But um, in healthy animals, there's also no difference, no matter if we use transfer modified PEI or, or just PEI, because they don't have um, a lot of uh, transfer receptor expression on their naive T cells. However, in the inflamed animals, the picture is different because here we have a lot of transfer receptor expression in the activated T cells, which interacts really in a lock key um, interaction with the, the transfer modified um, polymer. And so we were able to efficiently deliver the RNA into the, the T cells. And what was even more interesting was when we looked into all the different types uh, uh, in the cell, and we didn't um, stay for all different cell types, but the ones that we were mainly interested in. And we saw that uh, the uptake into T cells was really, um, was really striking. We had been worried about uptake into macrophages, um, for example, but considering that these particles were very small and about just about 50 nanometers in size, we didn't see a lot of uptake in macrophages. We also didn't see as much uptake in um, epithelial cells or eosinophils, for example. We did see some association with dendritic cells, um, which is something that uh, we decided to, to look into a bit further. And uh, so in the meantime, um, we also looked into a therapeutic effects, considering that this was just a proof of concept experiment with fluorescently labeled RNA. And uh, we used um, siRNA against SCADA3, where initially we had to optimize sequences and blends of different sequences. And um, so in this project, um, we used siRNA against SCADA3 and then measured the effect on the downstream cytokines such as interleukin-4, interleukin-5, and interleukin-13. And we saw that um, when we compared to the same nanocarrier with the negative control siRNA, in, uh, in all three cases, for all three cytokines, we saw a significant reduction of the, of the cytokine level so that uh, we were able to confirm that if we downregulate GATA3 in activated T cells, we can really have a therapeutic impact and, and a, a real therapeutic um, success in downregulating the, um, the downstream cytokines. Um, we essentially wanted to move on with in vivo experiments, um, but due to uh, 3R rules and, uh, and also um, some observations we had made in the meantime, that um, it can be tricky uh, for um, these transferrin PEI nanoparticles to escape the, MEC, the, the endosome. We, um, in the meantime, also worked on a blend of transferrin modified uh, PEI and melatonin PEI. But um, since melatonin is a B venom peptide, we were a little bit afraid um, to administer a melatonin PEI into, into animals, and we wanted to test um, the safety in, in an ex vivo model first. Um, what we do for these ex vivo models is that we usually obtain um, human lung tissue from the hospital. We have ethics approval to use these uh, use this patient material, and so we usually obtain um, peritumor tissue. So we um, make vibratome cut slices out of that tissue, and then depending on the project, um, uh, depending on if this is a, a cancer targeting project or not. We can use um, uh, cancer tissue or we can use peritumor tissue, um, which we consider more or less healthy tissue to um, continue with human, um, human lung tissue uh, for our experiments. 
And so um, what we did in this project uh, was that we initially had to um, uh, create uh, an, an asthmatic phenotype ex vivo in, in human tissue, um, because of course we don't always obtain asthmatic uh, tissue. So um, therefore we optimized the protocol um, to activate the tissue residing T cells and uh, we used Dynabeads against CD3 and CD28, which is something that we had initially optimized um, in primary T cells um, ex vivo, but now we optimized that um, for uh, the experiments in tissue. And uh, we were able to show that um, the activation of the tissue residing T cells um, works efficiently. So this is um, IL-13 is just one of the examples of the cytokines that we measured. Um, after three days and after five days, and we saw that both after three and five days, we get a good upregulation of pro-inflammatory cytokines, um, reflecting that the activation of the, um, uh, the the activation of the tissue residing uh, T cells uh, works efficiently. So, in the next step, we can then transfect, and so here we used our blended transferrin and melatonin PEI nanoparticles and um, then analyze uh, the tissue for um, GATA3 silencing, for example, as well as for um, downstream cytokines, and then most of all um, toxicity in human tissue, um, which can give us a lot, which can answer a lot of uh, additional questions um, compared to just having isolated T cells, for example. So in terms of the um, uh, gene silencing, um, uh, that worked quite efficiently. So we compared uh, the just transferrin PEI with the transferrin melatonin PEI, and so uh, we tried to titrate concentrations where we see that with 50 picomoles, um, we actually already obtain a very good gene silencing efficacy, particularly with our transferrin melatonin PEI. We also uh, were able to show that um, there are no toxic, toxic effects in, in the human lung tissue, so that uh, we're now ready uh, to move on to the, the animal exper experiment. And we also were able to show that the RNA is really taken up um, into the tissue, um, which explains why we see a, a very efficient um, GATA3 down regulation. But as I mentioned, um, we're very interested in, in uh, um, inhalation and in dry powder inhalation. And um, for me, as a pharmaceutical technologist by training, it's also um, it's it's really nice to be able to combine some of these more um, nanotechnological aspects uh, with classical pharmaceutical technology, where um, we use spray drying in order to um, transfer our nanoparticle suspensions into um, inhalable microparticles, because as I mentioned to you before, for efficient pulmonary um, administration and, and inhalation, we need to have particle sizes um, of a mass media and aerodynamic diameter below five micrometers. And so even though this is geometric um, diameter, it already gives us a bit of an idea um, if we're in the right um, size range, yes or no. And um, this essentially started as a, um, an inhalation project, but um, as I mentioned before, a dry powder formulation, of course, always um, also has the advantage of better um, storage stability and um, improved um, storage and transportation conditions. And um, if you look at the, the rollout um, uh, problems with the messenger RNA vaccines that initially um, had to be stored at extremely low temperatures, um, I believe that uh, the idea of obtaining a, a dry powder formulation from, um, from a, an RNA nanoparticle could also help um, to uh, supply all countries and, uh, and no matter what climate zone um, supply countries that also don't have the, the money and um, uh, the, the energy to waste on minus, uh, sub, min, sub, sub minus degree um, storage temperatures. So with improved stability, um, we would hopefully be able to also produce um, vaccines that can be stored at, at room temperature, for example. So what you will see here was our main concern when we started with the spray drying project, because as I mentioned, from spray drying, we obtain nano and microparticles, and um, these nano and microparticles in the lung need to be um, redispersed into nanoparticles again because the, the microparticles we need for the size for deposition in the lung, but the nanoparticles we need um, for um, efficient endocytosis into the cell. 
And so what you're seeing in this slide is actually the work um, of uh, uh, two uh, PhD students um, that optimized the process parameters of the spray drying um, method in order to obtain um, nano in micro formulations that would be redispersible and colloidally stable so that before and after spray drying, we would get essentially the same um, sizes. And uh, what we observed initially is that when we spray dried the nanoparticles, they usually um, agglomerated and aggregated, and we were not able to redisperse them into a size um, comparable to the freshly prepared particles. So what you see here in dark gray are always the um, sizes of the nanoparticles that were freshly prepared. And in light gray, you see the size of the particles um, that were spray dried and, and redispersed. And um, here in green, you see the trailose formulations, and in yellow, you see the mannitol formulations. And then you see inlet um, temperatures in the bottom that we um, use to spray dry these uh, nano suspensions. You can probably appreciate that as we increase the, uh, the temperature, we start to see a slight uh, tendency towards aggregation, both for trailose and for mannitol. But um, we have uh, at least three formulations where um, the particle sizes before and after spray drying and pre-dispersion were absolutely comparable. The, one of the next aspects um, for us was to look into aerodynamic properties, because as I mentioned, for deep lung deposition, we would need a mass median aerodynamic diameter of about five micrometers um, for deposition in the bronchial area, for example, um, even an MMID of six or seven would be perfectly fine if we want to deliver it to the throat. And then of course, even larger particles um, would be uh, suitable. But um, we compared the mass media and aerodynamic um, diameter with the geometric um, diameter that uh, you already saw in one of the pictures. Also looked into GSD, fine particle fraction and fine particle dose, of course. And you can see that interestingly um, for the trailose formulations, when we measured um, by static light scattering, the particle sizes seemed much larger. And um, so this can be explained by the fact that with trailose, we have um, an amorphous formulation. You can see the glass transition temperatures here, as well as the halo um, in the XRD. And with mannitol, we clearly have a, a crystalline um, formulation with a clear uh, melting point and, and then the, the, specific, the, the um, uh, characteristic peaks in, in the XRD. And so with the difference between a crystalline and an amorphous formulation, we also see differences in residual moisture after the spray drying. So the trailose amorphous formulation had a residual moisture close to 4% and was not as dry as the crystalline formulation with um, uh, less than 1% residual moisture. And so what you can probably appreciate uh, from the SEM images is that uh, with the, the higher residual moisture, we had particles that were essentially sticking together and were not uh, recognized as single particles in the static light scattering. And so this is why it seemed like the geometric diameter of these um, particles was larger, even if um, by imaging, we see that um, they are about the same. What was most important for us, of course, um, was bioactivity after spray drying. Um, we, we don't gain anything if, if we can spray dry, but it's not working anymore. And so we checked in the cell culture model of GFP expressing um, uh, human lung cancer cells. And uh, we compared um, lipofectamine, a commercially available transfection reagent, um, with our uh, PPP polymer nanoparticles. And we always compared the same um, sugar concentration that we obtain after redispersion of the, the dry powders, um, also for lipofectamine, because we, in previous experiments, we had seen that the presence of sugar um, can have an impact on transfection and efficacy. And so we always compare a negative control siRNA as a negative control with the, the GFP siRNA that ideally, in the best case scenario, um, gives us more than 90% gene silencing and then we compare lipofectamine with our um, polymers. And then for each condition, the 5% the trailose, 10% trailose, and 5% and 10% mannitol, we always compared um, the spray dried formulation with the freshly prepared. And so in all cases, you see that um, spray drying and, and redispersion did not have any negative impact on the activity of the freshly prepared um, nanoformulation. 
But we were also interested in seeing if this would work for our asthma approach, for example. So um, we also spray dried um, our transfer in PEI. And interestingly here, um, the, the mannitol formulation, the crystalline mannitol formulation worked much better for gene silencing um, uh, than the, the trailose formulation. And uh, you have to, of course, keep in mind that here we're not just spray drying um, a polymer nanoparticle, but that we also have the, the transfer in the glycoprotein that we need to protect during the spray drying process. So um, this is uh, uh, not exactly the same material and uh, we uh, have to adjust um, our conditions, spray drying conditions a little bit based on what kind of material we, we are spray drying. And so we were working on this um, asthma project for quite a while when uh, COVID hit. And so uh, we had just started uh, a collaboration with a virologist on a respiratory syncytical virus um, treatment when the pandemic started and we decided that uh, we had to shift our RSV project more into a COVID project. And so for these viral infections, um, what we do a lot is so-called air liquid interface and um, cell culture, where we grow the cells and on, um, on, uh, on substrates, on, uh, on meshes essentially. And um, then after 10 days, uh, we removed the, the cell culture medium from the apical um, part of the chamber, uh, which is called uh, the, the airlift. And um, at that point, the cells are grown at the interface uh, with, with air. So they're exposed to air on their apical side. And so they can differentiate and they will even start to produce mucus, which is shown in, in green here. So we can actually mimic this barrier that I mentioned before. And we can see how the presence of mucus um, is maybe a barrier for um, our therapeutic approaches. Due to the fact that this is a static model, we're also working on a so-called lung on a chip model where we have a dynamic system where we grow the cells at the air liquid interface, but we also have microfluidic channels that mimic the uh, circulation underneath um, the, the epithelium and, uh, and, and the endothelium so that uh, we're not just relying on this um, static model, but we can also um, uh, investigate the influx, the, the inf uh, uh, impact of, of flux. What you see here is that um, when we administer our nanoparticles to a, a, a mucus producing um, cell culture model, is that um, it's important um, to check if the RNA shown in red here really makes it into the cell layer or if it gets stuck in the mucus layer. So you can see the, the mucus layer shown in green here, and hopefully you can appreciate the red dots, which show that in this case, these particles really made it through the mucus and um, they are now in the cell layer. And uh, they're in the same layer as the, the nuclei shown in, in blue. So that's very important for us before we go on with any um, therapeutic uh, approaches. And so in this COVID model, we worked with um, a group that was initially at the Technical University of Munich, now moved to the um, University Hospital of Munich. And they, um, on the one side, had a GFP model of the virus where they were able to infect cells and then in live cell imaging um, experiments were able to show um, a decreased uh, proliferation of the virus when um, the cells were treated with, with siRNA. At the same time, uh, we, of course, wanted to use the wild type virus. And um, because, uh, as you probably know, um, wild type mice, for example, cannot be infected with COVID, um, uh, we would have had to use hamsters, for example, or ferrets. And uh, we decided to use uh, lung tissue, human lung tissue, where we knew that obviously the human lung can be infected very efficiently with um, SARS-2. So what we did that again, we made these precision cut lung slices um, out of human lung tissue. And so uh, we pre-transfected uh, with our siRNA nanoparticles and then infected with a wild type virus six hours later to run a, a PCR um, the next day to see um, how the viral proliferation would be inhibited. And so after optimizing the siRNA sequences and doses and uh, uh, dosing regimens and so on, with this um, uh, prophylactic approach of pre-transfecting six hours before the infection, we were able to decrease um, the viral titers um, uh, very significantly to a, a very low um, titer. The last project that I wanted to talk about today um, is a, a lung cancer project. And uh, 
uh, we did not use a Braxane, but um, I wanted to use a Braxane as a um, uh, as an example that probably many of you know. So, a Braxane is a nanoparticle that is clinically approved, and um, it's made out of uh, albumin, made out of serum albumin, and um, it binds paclitaxel, a very poorly soluble drug. And so what we did is that we essentially used a similar approach. We didn't encapsulate paclitaxel, but we encapsulated siRNA into our nanoparticles, our albumin nanoparticles. And so with these nanoparticles, we then delivered um, an siRNA against uh, a mutated KRAS. KRAS is a, uh, an oncogene that is mutated in most, um, uh, on many lung cancers. And uh, in this um, project, we used a specific um, mutated lung cancer where uh, um, the, the allele G12S is, is mutated. And we used siRNA against G12S, against um, G12S mutated KRAS and against all KRAS. And so you can see from the quantification of this Western blot that um, with the, the transfection against the specific uh, mutated KRAS or all KRAS, we saw a decrease in, in overall KRAS, um, which only proves that the, the transfection worked. However, um, as you may know, KRAS usually um, uh, causes oncogene addiction and uh, uncontrolled proliferation. So KRAS mutation usually um, causes this um, uh, uncontrolled proliferation of a tumor. So if we downregulate um, this, uh, this mutated KRAS, we hope to see an apoptosis, tumor apoptosis. And that's what you can see here in this um, a dot plot of flow cytometry, which is quantified um, here in, in this bar graph. So no matter if we used siRNA against um, all KRAS or siRNA against the mutated KRAS, we had um, about uh, uh, almost 30% um, apoptotic cells. And so that shows that with downregulating the mutated or all KRAS, um, uh, we can down we can increase apoptosis. And the advantage of the specific um, siRNA here is that um, in this case we only downregulate um, the mutated version, and we um, leave the um, the unmutated um, KRAS a little um, alone. So the next step we did this uh, migration assay, which is quantified here. So again. If we downregulate um, the mutated KRAS or all KRAS um, together, then we see a specific and, and very uh, efficient um, decrease in, in cancer cell mobility. But with siRNA, um, we unfortunately are only able to have a temporary effect. And so that's why my former postdoc um, decided to look more into CRISPR Cas delivery, where we would be able to um, perform genome editing. And so um, what we do in, in this model and this uh, project is that uh, we develop um, a guide RNA that's specific really for the mutated um, G12X, so that can be a G12S or G12D mutation. And uh, we leave essentially the, the wild type KRAS alone. And what she did is that she cloned a vector um, where she uh, added the KRAS sequence as well as the GFP sequence as well as the guide RNA sequence. Um, and for us, most importantly, we would be able to um, see the efficiently transfected cells um, that would be eGFP, um, green fluorescent protein um, positive. Then she used the, the different um, sequences for G12S and G12D uh, mutated uh, cells um, to have the, the specific guide RNA. And in the next step, um, she encapsulated um, all of this into a targeted um, PEI. So she used the same um, five kiloton PEI that we used for the transfer and targeting, but she uh, attached an FE body against ARP3, which is a, um, a, um, a cell surface receptor that is overexpressed in, in many um, cancers. And she encapsulated her um, vector, her um, uh, plasmid DNA, where she had included the, the Cas9 sequence, the GFP sequence, and the guide RNA sequence. So with these nanoparticles that she obtained, um, she uh, transfected tissues that we had received from a genetic mouse model, where the animals five months um, uh, after birth uh, tend to develop KRAS mutated tumors in the lung. And then we uh, used the, uh, the tumor tissue from these mice to transfect with these um, nanoparticles. 
and to perform the analysis afterwards. Initially, she checked um, for the uptake into the tumor tissue compared to the normal tissue. And um, she compared uh, having a, um, an IgG um, uh, control with the, the ARP3 positive cells. So we saw that in what we considered normal cells, um, we had only a little bit of, of ARP3 positive cells. And, uh, and this is peritumor tissue and then really in the tumor we had a lot of um, ARP3 positive cells um, that we were hoping to reach with our targeted nanoparticles. Then she checked um, GFP positive cells um, for um, these different vectors that she had made, either the, the empty vector with just the GFP, with the, the scrambled guide RNA, with the G12D um, RNA, and then with a control um, smaller plasmid uh, for just GFP, were due to the size and the more um, transcripts for GFP, we see a slightly higher um, uh, percentage of positive cells. But overall, we show that it doesn't matter um, what we add into the, the cloning vector, but um, we can deliver the vector very efficiently and show GFP expression no matter what guide RNA is uh, expressed later on. And so for our therapeutic approach, um, she then checked an um, indel formation based on having a scrambled control guide RNA or the specific G12D guide RNA for this um, uh, genetic mouse model. And she saw that um, with the, the specific guide RNA against the mutated KRAS, she had about 40% indel formation, which you um, can probably appreciate from this green line here. So with this, um, uh, I'm, I hope I was able to show you a little bit the potential of targeted delivery of nucleic acid therapeutics in general, the development of in vitro, ex vivo, and in vivo models of disease and that we use in, in our research, as well as the improvement of starch stability and inhalability of dry powder formulations. What we're currently doing is uh, we're repeating a lot of the work that we've done with PEI now with our new biodegradable spermine-based nanocarriers. We also started a project on lipid nanoparticle spray drying and um, specifically for um, vaccine stability. And uh, we're, we uh, are currently starting the in vivo work um, the KRA study, the asthma study, as well as the, the anti-COVID study with an overall aim of developing nanoparticle-based nucleic acid uh, therapeutics. And with this, I'd like to thank you for your attention. Um, I also would like to thank the, the people in my lab who, who do all the work. And, um, and then most of all, our funding, um, our funders, uh, funding agencies that have uh, supported all of this work. And um, I'm happy to take any questions, of course. Well, this is Matthew, uh, Professor Merkel. This has been a very, very interesting, very, very thoroughly presented scientific material. And thank you very much from all of us. Uh, we are going to follow with the Q&A session. So I request uh, Kaushik to take over the Q&A. Thank you. Hello, Kaushik. Okay, I can do that. Yes, I, I, yeah, I'm, I'm there now. Okay, fine. Thank you. Yeah, Olivia, thank you very much once again. I just echo the same opinion what Matthew has said. And even I got excellent feedback in the chat box about this presentation and the research work what you have presented is really cutting edge technology. And it has also excited people to ask few questions. The first question I'll take, uh, there is a is there any other nanoparticles carrier than lipid nanoparticles? So, I mean, of, of course, um, the, there are a lot of uh, nanoparticles um, that are being used uh, preclinically for, um, for clinically approved materials. Um, we currently have uh, the, the lipid nanoparticles, and then, as I mentioned, um, albumin nanoparticles are approved for um, other purposes. So, for paclitaxel delivery, for example, um, abraxane as um, albumin nanoparticles are approved, but um, for nucleic acid delivery, unfortunately so far only lipid nanoparticles are approved, even if um, several companies such as uh, BioNTech and uh, CureVac have lately um, filed patents on using PEI and, and other polymers. So we're hoping uh, to see more development and, and also more clinical development of additional materials in the, in the coming years, of course. 
Yeah, thank you, Olivia. There's another question. Do you suggest buccal tab tablets of lipid nanoparticles for better patient's compliance? So um, tablets for, for per oral administration? Yes, please. And, and I think that's, um, I mean, due to the, uh, the fact um, that uh, it, it would be quite difficult. I mean, of course, with an enteric coding, for example, you could, to some extent, you could uh, shield um, these tablets from the, from the, the harsh environment of, of the, the gastrointestinal tract, mostly the, the um, uh, uh, hydrochloric acid in, in the stomach. However, um, we would then have to see what the absorption um, of an RNA-loaded um, nanoparticle is like in the intestines. And uh, if you are targeting a more uh, local um, uh, therapy, such as for, let's say, colitis um, or, or any other uh, diseases within the intestines, then I think it, it might be maybe a bit more feasible. However, um, I believe that it would be quite difficult to obtain a good systemic bioavailability of a nanoparticle, um, of an RNA-loaded nanoparticle um, through the, the peroral route and, and through intestinal absorption. So I think a, a tablet, um, I mean, of course, would have the, the, the highest um, patient compliance, but I think it's still rather far away, unfortunately. Uh, there's a question. Can you check the lung tolerance capacity? Yes. So we actually do that um, in the um, in the asthma um, protocol. So uh, we usually measure lung function, and um, and so um, obviously the um, the the more asthmatic animals, so the the animals with um, asthmatic symptoms, they usually have a much lower lung function, and we usually measure pen age, um, which is not the absolute perfect way of, of measuring lung function. So we don't have a way of, of measuring um, FEV1, for example, but it's an accepted model to test lung function. And um, we can do that um, for, for therapeutic uh, uh, purposes. And then in terms of um, tolerability, in terms of, let's say, toxicity, we usually check. Um, so um, in the animals, we lavage the lungs and uh, we check um, cytokines and chemokines in the lung lavage, as well as um, in the, the mobile cells um, that we lavage out of the lungs. And um, we, uh, we usually compare um, untreated animals with just uh, animals that receive sham. And um, we, we, so for PEI and for um, transferrin modified PEI, as well as our new polyspermines, we actually don't see any significant upregulation or a secretion of um, any of the pro-inflammatory cytokines. Um, however, I will say that um, in the in the asthma animal model, where the animals already have pre-existing inflammation in the lung, if we treat those animals with a PEI, for example, we see a further increase of the pro-inflammatory markers. So. That's why I mentioned before, PEI is quite well um, uh, tolerated in, in healthy lungs. But if there's pre-existing um, inflammation, then um, we actually see a further increase of the uh, pro-inflammatory markers. Oh, thank you. Uh, this is a question one more now. If it is, uh, sorry, uh, if it is ideal to produce nasal spray containing biological substance as RNA, since the amount of particle absorbed in the final destination in the lung may be very low, yeah. 25%. Yeah, I agree. So it's actually, so um, you saw the, the spec images of, of the mice that we had treated. And so um, with the um, inhalation route, we usually get about 40% of the dose um, into the lung, which is still um, a large, uh, large loss of material. So of course, we see some in the oropharynx, some that the animals also swallow, um, uh, even, for example, when we pull out the tube. Um, so, I mean, even uh, with inhalation, we don't uh, receive 100% deposition in the lung, but with nasal sprays, um, we're closer to about 10% of the dose. And so that's why um, I wanted to show these images today, because I think... Um, I mean, of course, it's much easier to uh, develop uh, a nasal spray formulation compared to anything that, that can be inhaled. So no matter if you go for, um, for a, a, 
um, uh, a mist, uh, if you go for um, uh, a nebulizer, uh, a PMDI, uh, a DPI. So there's always a lot of um, engineering, a lot of development work involved. However, um, the inhalation route really is the best route to deliver um, to the lungs because with the nasal route, um, you unfortunately just have a very low amount of drug that is delivered into the deep lungs. Okay, thank you. Uh, there's a question regarding the in vitro model used. That is a CALU dash. What cells were used to cultivate on the biosolateral side? And maybe the questionnaire has missed one point about produced mucus in the model. How were they produced by KALU3 itself? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so that the KALU3 cells um, are one of the, the typical models um, for this air liquid interface um, uh, in vitro model. And so KALU3 cells, when they're grown at air interface, um, <coughs> they actually, they they start to produce mucus um, without, so you don't have to do anything about it. You just have to give them time. So as soon as they um, produce a monolayer um, uh, of cells, they also start to differentiate. Um, what we also observed, which was quite important for our COVID uh, projects, uh, was that when they are grown in submerged um, 2D culture, they don't have a lot of um, ACE2 receptor expression, the, the target receptor for the virus. So you will not get an optimal um, infection. Um, whereas if they're grown on the air liquid interface in the in the apical side, um, they also start to express a lot of ACE2 receptor. And so they produce the mucus just by themselves. So they, they have the genetic information to produce the mucus, but they won't um, uh, uh, before they aren't uh, differentiated and, and polarized. As soon as they are polarized, then um, these cells will produce uh, quite uh, some mucus. They produce more mucus than RPMI nasal cells, for example, and uh, a lot more um, than HVAC cells, for example. So um, if you're interested in a mucus producing model, Calum 3 cells are actually uh, very suitable. Okay, thank you. Uh, maybe a one or two questions more. Uh, there's a comment as well as a question. There is a general opinion that PEI is toxic to cells. Uh, what you use LMW PEI, but it may have low transfection efficiency. Mm -hmm. Any thoughts on that? Also, is it not feasible to use suspension instead of a dry? So the, the, the comment about the PEI toxicity is absolutely true. And so this is why I mentioned that uh, more and more we're trying to move away from PEI but um, we're starting to use more of our um, biodegradable um, uh, uh, um, polyspermines. And so for the low molecular weight PEI, um, it depends a bit on, on what you are transfecting. So for plasmid, um, low molecular weight PEI is, is uh, obviously not very efficient. For short interfering RNA, the 5 kilodalton PEI um, works quite well. And, uh, and the last part of the, the question I, I didn't, uh, or the comment I, I didn't understand, unfortunately, with the uh, dispersion. They're asking, is, there's a is it not feasible to use suspension instead of a dry powder? Ah, so um, to uh, simply make a mist of, of the suspension, it, it certainly is. So you can um, also, I mean, as I mentioned before, you can simply use a nebulizer and so uh, you can nebulize uh, the suspended nanoparticles. However, um, if you look into both physical um, instability issues and microbial um, instability issues, then of course a dry powder um, formulation um, has advantages in terms of uh, storage stability because with a, a suspension, then uh, the suspension of course always tends uh, towards aggregation. And, uh, and if, you look into, if you look at the, the messenger RNA vaccines, then it needs some um, very low temperature storage and, and transportation. And so the advantage um, of, of the dry powder um, over the, uh, the suspension that can be nebulized, of course, um, is that uh, you would have a dry powder that can be stored easily and um, uh, can also uh, avoid any physical instabilities of, of the nanoparticles. Since there's um, hardly any liquid and it doesn't contain RNAs, for example, um, it, uh, it doesn't, it's not um, uh, prone to microbial um, uh, uh, instabilities. Um, and the, the, the disadvantage of the nebulization um, uh, is what I mentioned before, is that usually patients are 
are not patient enough uh, to sit and inhale for half an hour or an hour or so. And um, we also have to look into um, the shear force during nebulization, which can, of course, also cause um, stability issues with uh, nanosuspensions, where these nanoparticles also tend to aggregate or dissociate due to the shear force um, during, the, during the nebulization process. And that can be optimized with a um, vibrating mesh nebulizer compared to jet nebulizer, for example, but it still is a harsh um, a shear force that impacts on the nanoparticles. And with the spray drying, we of course also have um, a very short moment of, of nebulization, but um, on, it's, a, it's a very short um, a shear stress impact on the, the particles. And so you would have to essentially do a similar study compared to what we did regarding a colloidal stability. So after nebulization, you'd also have to check the, the colloidal stability and the, the ionic retention within the nanoparticle. Thank you, Oliva. You made it very interesting and uh, thought-provoking with your excellent uh, Q&A session. I over to Matthew now. I am done with questions. This is Matthew. I have a question, Olivia. Uh, drugs administered into the lungs need to be sterile, no? So you need to do aseptic spray drying? Yeah. That's true. So at the moment, um, we're not, um, but so we're actually in, in the process of uh, setting up a, a clean room facility for spray drying, where we would then be able um, to spray dry under sterile conditions and then test for um, uh, absence of, of uh, um, uh, contamination and would then be able to um, hopefully obtain uh, uh, sterile um, formulations. Great. And the lipids that you used, are they proprietary lipids? Are they available to the general public? So for the, the lipid nanoparticle projects, um, we essentially use the, the Onpetro formulation. And um, so that is more or less uh, accessible to the, the general public. For our new materials that we have uh, synthesized, the, the polyspermines, we've, um, uh, we've filed a, a patent application so that um, hopefully if the patent is granted, um, then it would be a, a proprietary um, material. And, and you have nanoparticles within microparticles. Are the microparticles optimized for lung delivery or you still need to do more work? No, the, um, the spray drying process uh, really over the course of, of two PhDs uh, was optimized in a way that um, the, the aerodynamic properties um, are ideal for deposition into the, the bronchial area. Um, if we wanted to um, deliver through the lungs, so if we wanted to achieve systemic bioavailability, then we would potentially have to optimize um, a little bit further. But um, our goal usually is the delivery to the lung and, and not through the lung. And so for those purposes, um, after the, uh, the input of, of those two PhD students, uh, we consider the, the formulation optimized. Okay, great. Um, I don't have any more questions. Um, Olivia, we want to thank you on behalf of FIP. This has been one of the most interesting presentations we have had lately. This is cutting edge technology. As we all know, this was something similar was used in the COVID vaccines, for example. So I see a great future for this technology. And uh, thank you uh, for making such a beautiful presentation. Uh, this has been recorded. It is available uh, for those of us who want to watch it again on the FIP website. It will be available for one full year. And there is also a YouTube recording available also. So thank you again, Olivia. Great presentation. Thank, thank you. you very much. And thanks to the audience all over the world. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. We end the webinar now. Thank you. <laughs>